This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Good evening. I'm delighted to see you here and to welcome you to this uh, event of the Walter H. Capp Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life. It's always a pleasure to uh, welcome many people, and that always includes a few new people. So we're so delighted to have all of you here. I want to call to your attention that in your seat you will find this flyer about CAP Center events over the next uh, several weeks. We have a pretty uh, busy schedule in January and February, as you see. This is the 10th anniversary of the, of the CAP Center. We, we were founded ten, exactly 10 years ago in January. So uh, one reason why we're having an, quite a number of events at this particular time is because of our s celebration of 10 years. And, We've come, I think, a far ways. We've, uh, we've. I, I don't have handy figures about how many lecturers we've had and how many programs we've had initiated during this time, but it's uh, it's quite a number. We average about uh, eight or ten lectures a year. I should also note that we have several internship programs. One of those internship programs is to send students to work in nonprofits here in Santa Barbara, in the Santa Barbara area. And we have several of them over here, uh, two or three, and I'm always delighted to uh, have them present. Of course, they help with this. They have part of this uh, wonderful program that Sarah Miller McCune endowed for us. We're very grateful for that uh, uh, program and for all that it's accomplishing. We also send interns to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and to Sacramento. So those are three internship programs that are a very important part of what the CAP Center does with respect to students. And then, of course, as I was saying, the programming we do in the community and occasionally on campus with lectures with uh, eight or ten of those a year. I should also note that uh, copies of uh, our speaker's book, her latest book, uh, are available over here, and after the uh, uh, conclusion of the lecture, she'll be available to sign them, uh, those that are purchased. Um, we hope that you will uh, uh, take a look at those books. I have read her book, and I can tell you it's uh, an incredible piece of scholarship with a lot of passion built into what she describes. Uh, with respect to the needs of children in war zones and her marvelous uh, uh, description of her own experiences and how she got into this important work. Dr. Samantha Nutt is an award-winning humanitarian, acclaimed public speaker, and a leading authority on the impact of war on civilians. A medical doctor and founder of War Child, an international humanitarian organization, she has worked with children and their families at the front, front line of many of the world's major crises, from Iraq to Afghanistan, Somalia to the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Sierra Leone to Darfur, 
Darfur, Sudan. Committed to human rights and social justice, her humanitarian work has benefited many thousands of war-affected children globally. As one of the most original and influential voices in, in the humanitarian arena, Dr. Nutt is a respected authority for many of North America's leading media outlets. She was recently named one of Canada's 25 transformational Canadians by the Globe and Mail, and has been recognized as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Time Magazine has featured her as one of Canada's five leading activists, and Dr. Nutt was recently appointed to the Order of Canada, Canada's highest civilian honor, for her contributions to improving the plight of young people in the world's most conflicted zones. Dr. Nutt gradu graduated from McMaster University, earning a Master of Science in Public Health from the University of London, and holds a fellowship in community medicine from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. She is further certified by the College of Family Practice and completed a subspecialization in women's health through the University of Toronto as a woman's health scholar. She is a recipient of numerous honorary doctorates from universities in Canada and the United States. Her book, which I've already mentioned, Damned Nations, is a bracing and uncompromising account of her work over the course of 15 years in some of the most devastated regions of the world. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Samantha Nutt to you as this year's human rights speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. I, um, it is really my pleasure and privilege to be here. I know that the CAPS Center has a wonderful tradition of some very prominent uh, and significant speakers who have been here over the years. And so let me just, I guess, apologize in advance for being the first nut. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say thank you for braving this cold weather. Um, now, this is very funny to me because I come from Toronto, and uh, weather like this, we actually have a, a four-letter word for this kind of weather. It's called June. So, <laughs> so, so I do just want to say um, I, I appreciate that by uh, local standards this is a, a major freeze, but um, I'm, <laughs> I'm really grateful to be here, and I certainly hope one of you will adopt me before I leave this evening. Um, now, I, uh, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, a couple of different issues. I'm here to talk about some of the issues that I reflect upon in my new book, which is called Damned Nations, Greed, Guns, Armies, and Aid. Uh, for those of you who who missed my first international bestseller. It was called uh, The Humanitarian Impact of Economic Sanctions on Post-Coup Burundi in 1998. Um, I am very grateful to the four people worldwide who purchased it. <laughs> <laughs> I've made the transition from academic to something, uh, I don't know, hopefully a little bit more um, accessible, I guess. Uh, but I, I do want to reflect on the factors that contribute to violence and instability in uh, various parts of the world, and the impact that this is having on civilians, in particular on women and children. And I really do believe that it is an important time for us to be discussing some of these issues, because it's very easy to pick up a newspaper these days, for those of us who still um, are dinosaurs, ha! Huh. How about that? <laughs> Dinosaur is enough to be reading print journalists these days. Um, but, you know, it's easy to pick up a newspaper and to feel very, just to feel overwhelmed uh, by the information at hand in terms of what's going on in our global community. You just have to think about the crippling economic crisis, armed conflict in 26 countries around the world, unsettling evidence of accelerated climate change, terrorism, 
AIDS. I mean, it, the, list is, the list is very long indeed. And when you read these headlines, it is easy to feel, I think, for any one of us and as communities, uh, that anything that we do, that it will never amount to very much, as if no amount of individual I initiative or personal philanthropy can ever actually change the status quo. And yet my experiences over the past 16 years have found that to be absolutely untrue. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about this evening. And I'm going to be drawing on some examples from my own work and experiences in war-torn countries around the world, some of which will be, some of these stories will be difficult, admittedly difficult, I think, for uh, many of you here this evening to, to hear. Um, but I think that they're nevertheless important stories because it is so easy for us living uh, as we do in, in relative comfort and prosperity and peace, to tune it out, you know, to think as if it's all far too overwhelming uh, for us to actually pay attention to it. And what I'm going to do is, I think we're very used to seeing the images of those who are living with war and violence around the world. And one of the things you'll notice about my presentation is that I don't show slides. There are no pictures. Well, I guess they're not slides anymore. They'd be a PowerPoint presentation. Now I just dated myself. Um, maybe I have to go outside and stand with the dinosaurs. But the, you know, I, I think that we see these images and we fail to identify. Um, we fail to really meaningfully understand those stories. And so tonight I'm hoping that by telling you some of those stories in a more narrative way, that you'll be able to even see yourselves and see your own roles in these crises in a, in a different fashion. And I do want to talk very specifically about how it is that we can actually affect social change and why it is that your leadership and your voices and your opinions and your politics, why these things actually do matter. So let's get started. For those of you who wonder whether I must have been very focused and determined uh, to end up being a doctor and to start an international aid organization, I run an organization called War Child that works in about a dozen different war-torn countries around the world. Uh, you probably think that, you know, I really had it all together at a very young age, and I can assure you that this is not the case. Um, my grade 12 report card, the principal very famously wrote, Samantha is a disruptive force in a sound environment. <laughs> that was after my physics teacher had, wrote, had written that I was completely incapable of understanding physics. This was before teachers had to worry about your self-esteem. I understand it's all changed now. <laughs> uh, all of this caused a great deal of upheaval in the nut house. Yeah, elementary school was really fun for me. Um, but, you know, as a medical student, once I finally did get my act together and go on to, it turns out that when you're a disruptive force in high school, that is a bad thing. But suddenly when you get to university and you're a disruptive force, they call it independent thinking. And um, so that ended up working uh, to, to my advantage. And so I ended up uh, applying and being accepted to medical school at McMaster. And during my time there, I was very interested in the connection, became very interested in the connection between health and human rights. And it was for this reason that I accepted a scholarship to study public health in developing countries in England at the London School. And while I was there, I, I ended up receiving a, an email inviting me, I was looking to do my master's thesis around the impact of war on the health of women. And so I received a, a, an email from a, a team at UNICEF. They were putting together a group of international experts uh, to look at war-torn Somalia and the health needs that were emerging in war-torn Somalia. And I was 25, and it was uh, 1995. And um, now for those of you trying to do the math, I'm 42, let's all move on. <laughs> and for, for those of you who are wondering what my secret must be, let me just tell you this. I live in Toronto, it is freezing there, there is no need for plastic surgery because your face is always in that frozen state. <laughs> but um, it was an interesting time for me because I was sent this email 
asking if I would be the only uh, young woman to join this uh, assessment team that would be traveling throughout the country and uh, to look at what the most emerging threats might be. And it was a really critical time because it was during the second wave of a famine. And it was right after the withdrawal of troops that were deployed during Operation Restore Hope. So if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, you might know a little bit about, uh, about that sort of situation or if you followed it at the time. Um, and at the same time, it was also about six months after the Rwandan genocide. And so what had happened was that prior to the Rwandan genocide, there were roughly 200 international non-governmental organizations that were working in Somalia. And within that six-month period, most of them pulled out and there were fewer than 40 remaining in the country. And so because they were responsible for literally every health program and educational program, you can imagine the chaos that unfolded afterwards. And so it was not surprising that we began to see increasing rates of diarrheal disease and famine and, uh, and vaccine-preventable illnesses. And so UNICEF was struggling amidst this chaos to figure out what the priorities should be. And this was why they were convening this team to then present the findings to the UN Security Council. And this was the offer that came through for me to do this work and to travel throughout the country interviewing women and visiting health clinics. And it was uh, a contract that I was offered for exactly one dollar. I got half the money up front. I had a massive medical school loan. That it was a contract I was offered by a, a phenomenal uh, American man by the name of Pierce Garrity, who was a Yale-trained lawyer, um, who tragically ended up dying in the uh, Swiss air disaster off of uh, Peggy's Cove. But um, he was uh, an extraordinary man and gave me my first opportunity, really, to, to do this kind of work. And it was a decision to accept this position with UNICEF that fundamentally changed my life and the course of my professional career. And I was based in a part of Somalia which is called Baidoa which is in the south central part of uh, that African country. And it was very well known at that moment in time because Baidoa had been called the city of death by Western journalists. And it was called the city of death because about one quarter of a million people had died in Baidoa. I mean, imagine that for just a moment. One quarter of a million people. And so as I arrived, not surprisingly, uh, mass starvation was rampant throughout the country. You literally, there were, there were bodies in the streets. Uh, everywhere that you, you went, you just were confronted by the lawlessness and the insecurity in that country. And I can remember one of the most sort of distinct moments um, in terms of the turning point of my career came when I had been standing with these women in front of a feeding center. And they were all clinging, they had their infants that they were clinging to. And about 20 minutes into our conversation, I was just wrapping up my notes. And I leaned forward and I tried to put my finger in the palm of one of the baby's hands. And when I did that, I discovered shockingly that the baby was already dead. And this woman had still been standing there for several hours, hoping that something could be done for her child. And this scene played itself out over and over again across the country. And sadly, 20 years later, Somalia really is, is no different, as we saw during the, the summer months when there was a resurgence of famine and tens of thousands were dying. But by far, the biggest problem in Somalia then as it is now, was the sheer number of guns in that country. AK-47s and rocket-propelled grenades and machine guns were absolutely everywhere. This was a failed state, no functioning government. And what that actually means in a practical sense when you're confronting these kinds of issues, is that gangs of teenage boys who carry automatic rifles, they thrive with impunity. And they literally 
kill or obstruct or seize or rape everyone that crosses their path. And in this respect, Somalia would prove to be no exception, because in every country in which I have worked for the better part of 16 years, in Burundi, in Iraq, multiple times in Afghanistan, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Congo, in northern Uganda, and elsewhere, I have come face to face with children. And in many instances, those kids are as young as eight. And they have never been to school. But those kids have fought and they have killed with Kalishnikov rifles. So what opportunities exist for us to effect change here? Well, let's use Somalia as our reference point for just one moment. You know, it is, it is certainly the case that this is a country that was propped up militarily during the Cold War and which later descended into anarchy. And it is true that in Somalia, generations of warlords have trained and recruited children to fight in their battles in full and flagrant violation of international law. When we look at the Al-Shabaab youth movement and the threat that this has presented not just locally to Somalis and to the aid efforts in that country, but globally as well, attracting the attention of young Somali men from the diaspora communities in places like Canada and the United States. I mean, the, the roots of these movements existed even two decades ago in the absence of education, in the absence of income generating opportunities. These were all critically important factors. But to understand the role that any one of us can play in preventing or at least trying to reduce the threat of war in many countries around the world, we also need to look at why it is that in places like Somalia, even today, automatic rifles are more readily available and accessible than clean drinking water. How does this happen? Well, for one thing, it really is a question of supply. This is the interactive part of the presentation. I'm gonna ask for some estimates here. How many AK-47s do you think that there are in the world right now? Just shout out an answer, don't be embarrassed. Three billion? Well, you know, if you include all small arms, it is pretty close to one billion. But if you look at just the AK-47s that we know of, not the ones that we don't know of, I mean, obviously you can extrapolate as, as much as you want. It could be as many as two or three that we don't know of for every one that we do know of. But of the ones that we do know of, it's roughly 200 million. And how much do you think you can buy an illegal automatic rifle like an AK-47 for on a parallel market in a developing country like Somalia, how much do you think that would set you back? $100? You know, we would all be a lot safer if it was $100. It's usually between 50, around, around 50 bucks, and it can be even cheaper than that. It is less than the price of admission to most American theme parks. You know, these are lightweight, and they are very popular with child soldiers because they're very easy to load and reload. Steel killing machines that with a clip, and they're widely available, is capable of firing up to 600 rounds in less than one minute. 600 rounds in less than one minute. You know, even Mikhail Kalishnikov has expressed regret, and this is true, that he did not invent a lawnmower instead. And you might think, okay, well, hang on, right? Because, you know, we're kind of talking about the mid-1990s and at the end of the Cold War, all of these old Soviet Russian, you know, Soviet arms and everything else ended up in circulation. And surely in the wake of September 11th, we are a lot smarter about these things now. That would be a reasonable assumption. It would also be incorrect. Right now, 70% of all the weapons that are being sold in the world are being purchased by developing countries, particularly in Africa and in Asia and the Middle East. The 
annual revenues the, of the combined arms sales of the world's top 100 arms manufacturers is now in excess of $400 billion a year, which represents a more than 60% increase since 2002. And where do you think that 90% of these weapons come from? Want to shout out some names? I would say the USA. The US is one, but not alone. You're responsible for about 50% of those weapons. Where about the other ones? France, Germany is, China, England, Russia. But actually, in total, 90% of those weapons, they come from the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Annual worldwide military spending is $1.5 trillion. That is the highest point after adjusting for inflation since World War II, and it is wholly unsustainable. And I don't, I'm sure that I don't need to remind most of you in this room who braved a cold night to come out and hear me speak. You're already fairly well informed, I would imagine. But I'm sure you all know that the now deposed Mubarak was the second largest recipient of American military aid for a better part of well, more than a decade. Or that the European Union in the past six years since the sanctions were lifted against Gaddafi, the European Union approved more than $1 billion worth of arms export licensing agreements for the now deceased but always deranged Muammar Gaddafi. $1 billion or that as late as March of 2010, the U.S. was still trying to establish closer military ties with Gaddafi. Globally, we invest 10 times as much money fighting and killing one another as, the, as we do in ensuring that the children of this world have the opportunity to be fed, to be vaccinated, and to attend school, and to have access to clean drinking water through International Development Assistance, ODA. And what if I also told you, if you think, well, but you know, 70% of the weapons, maybe they're going to new and emerging democracies in developing countries that deserve the right to be able to protect and promote their own interests. Maybe they're going to legitimate armies. Maybe they're going to legitimate security forces except they're not. Because according to the Small Arms Survey, which is an international think tank, it's the international kind of monitoring group based out of Geneva that actually looks at where our arms are going and what they're being used for, roughly 75% of the world's small arms are not in the hands of legitimate governments and police forces, but they are in the hands of civilians, many tens of thousands of whom are actually child soldiers fighting in conflicts around the world. So what kind of action is needed? Well, for one thing, I think, it, and this is a long overdue policy discussion, we need to begin to look at the issue of arms control, not as distinct from peace and security concerns, but as absolutely integral to those, to con those concerns. And 2012 will be a watershed year for the Small Arms Treaty, the Arms Trade Treaty, uh, which hopefully will bring about greater restrictions around the manufacturing and supply and sale and transfer of weapons around the world. But it is critically important for all of us here to remind our policymakers that we believe that this is worth their attention and worth Worth their support. But we can go further than that because we can also make a difference and advocate for disarmament by ensuring that children around the world have other options through development initiatives that focus on education, economic development, and skills training for young people, uh, particularly in conflict and post-conflict environments around the world, which is one of the, the cornerstones of, of War Child's work internationally. But light weapons and military munitions are not the only thing that connect us to violence and instability in other parts of the world and where our action is needed. And now I'm going to give you another example. And this one, I guarantee, directly connects to each and every single one of you here. 
you know, one of the worst places to live in the world right now, if you are a woman especially, is the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly Zaire. This is a conflict a, that has left more than five million people dead since 1997. Five million people. More than 30,000 kids have been fighting as child soldiers in that conflict, and they are under the age of 18, and they have been implicated in some of the worst, most egregious human rights violations of the 21st century. And the Congo is literally full of mothers and grandmothers and infants and little girls who have been savagely and brutally sexually assaulted as a result of the war in that country. In fact, in international circles, we frequently refer to this as the war against women. And all of this is happening despite democratic elections having taken place in that country. Very recently, more, more, uh, there were democratic elections as well. And despite the presence of more than 10,000 United Nations peacekeepers. So what do we, how does this happen? Well, one of the things that we know about rape is that it is always a crime of power and it is a crime of opportunity. And in the Congo, it is a form of power that is so intense in its frequency that it is almost accepted as normal. There is very little shame in raping in the Congo and no mechanism with which to deal with rapists. But there is still great stigma attached to having been raped. But to understand what is needed from any one of us here, we also need to understand how it is that this keeps happening. And it happens in part because of the Congo's very long and very complicated history. And if you are interested in learning more about Congolese history, an excellent book is by Adam Hothschild, which is called King Leopold's Ghost. And if you haven't read it, I would strongly encourage you to pick up a copy of it. It looks at the roots of the humanitarian movement as well. But essentially, the Congo suffers from literally centuries of corruption and rampant exploitation. It began during the slave trade. It continued right through during the colonial decades under the Belgians, who, who rapidly exported uh, rubber and abused local Congolese civilians in the process while building grand monuments within Brussels itself. And then that continued on right through to the very malignant dictator Mobutu Sese Seko. Uh, it is a war that has been, at times at least, uh, influenced by some very pronounced ethnic divisions regionally. And principally, this, the current form of this war started during the Rwandan genocide when millions fled from Rwanda into what was then Zaire. And among those refugees were many of the perpetrators of the Rwandan genocide, who then proceeded to destabilize the eastern Congo as well. But at the heart of the war in the Congo right now, also, also lies an international as well as national struggle to control that country's vast resources. And many of those resources include precious minerals and metals and timbers, timber and stones. And of particular importance to all of us in this room is one mineral called coltan. It's also called tantalum. And I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have heard of coltan? Excellent. Coltan, for those of you who don't know, looks like black coal. And it is a conducting element. And it can be found in all of our cell phones and our computers and our video game consoles. It essentially makes those pieces of electronics run faster. And the Congo is believed to contain the world's largest coltan deposits, accounting for between 60 to 80% of the world's coltan.
and it is readily smuggled across borders, especially with Rwanda and with Uganda, and it is sold in exchange for cash and in exchange for weapons, and for the past 10 years, it has been actively, among other precious minerals and metals, including tin and tungsten and cobalt, it has been actively financing the war in that country. And in fact, Congolese doctors who are treating rape victims like Aline have, from a demographic point of view, I'm gonna give you a little public health sort of lesson here. They took a massive map of the region of Eastern Congo and what they did was they looked at cases of rape and where those rapes were occurring that were being reported at hospitals. And they plotted them on that geographic map. And just like you would do if you were trying to track the source of a disease, they found that the closer you got to the mining areas and the itinerant rapists and criminals and mercenaries and militia groups that are attracted to those mines and to those revenues, the closer you got to those areas, the higher the incidence of what's called rape with extreme violence, REV. And REV is exactly what Aline experienced because very frequently it involves gang rape and the amputations of a girl's breasts or genitalia or other parts of her anatomy. And this problem of resources and the competition to control them is creating untenable situations, not just in places like the Congo, but I can assure you, and I'm just back from, from South Sudan, in other war-torn areas as well. One of the most significant things that any one of us can do is to take the time to understand the global measure of our impact and to begin to make more informed and ethical choices and to encourage others to do the same. Because we can very often be connected to the subjugation of women and girls, sometimes by the very things that we do every single day. Every time we email our friends, every time we pick up our phones, every time we make unwise investment decisions in the world's arms manufacturers, and every time we profess our undying love for one another in the form of a conflict diamond. You know, the vile Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe made hundreds of millions of dollars last year, undermining the entire Kimberley process on conflict diamonds, made hundreds of millions of dollars off of the sale of Zimbabwean diamonds. It is obscene. The world desperately needs for all of us to be engaged and to pay attention to what is happening within and beyond our borders, and to look at new solutions to the problems that threaten our collective well-being. One of the most powerful things that Aline said to me before she left my office that day, she turned to me in, in we were speaking in French, and she turned to me in French and she said, tout ça c'est pour toi, all this is for you. On meurt pour rien. We die for nothing. I think that we owe it to young girls like Aline to ensure that we are more socially engaged and socially aware and are at least beginning to understand and question some of our consumer and investment practices. And to some, I recognize that this sounds very idealistic. And I hear from people all the time who are convinced that the challenges facing those living beyond our borders are insurmountable, that their governments are corrupt, and that humanitarian aid is wasted, and that whatever we do, it can never and it will never be enough. You know, you just have to tune into the Republican debates, and someone is going off on why it is we need to cancel international humanitarian assistance, international aid spending. You know, and I hear from people like this all the time. And over the years, you know, one of the most common criticisms that can be leveled at those of us who work in aid and who are interested in these kinds of social justice challenges, and I've heard many of these criticisms over the years. You know, I've been called everything from I've been called idealistic, I've been called naive, I've been called simplistic, I've been called childish, 
It's not just because of how I look. I've even called a prophylactic once. That was very interesting. <laughs> but what astonishes me is that it's as if those of us who struggle to articulate and invest in solutions, the assumption is that we are somehow less intellectually astute than those who are mired in criticism. And in my experience, these are vacuous assertions that are leveled by those who lack the creative and intellectual fortitude to propose and debate alternatives, or very simply to get off the couch. But, thank you. <laughs> but you know, I can't deny that there haven't been times when I too have felt overwhelmed by the pressures and that sense that whatever we do, the odds are stacked against us and that it will never be enough. And I was thinking of this not long ago when I was visiting our program in Darfur, Sudan. And to give you a sense of the background of the conflict in Darfur, Sudan, you know, this is a conflict that has left about 300,000 people dead since 2003. And it has forced two million people from their homes, mostly within the region still, but into camps for internally displaced, that's what we call them, internally displaced camps, IDP camps. And Warchild's been on the ground uh, over the past six years in six different centers in the western part of Darfur, six different IDP centers. And we run learning programs. We have these uh, kind of safe spaces where we uh, have set up during the day. We have educational programs and catch-up learning programs for children and skills training programs for young people as one of the mechanisms to keep them out of the militias. And in the evening, we run adult literacy programs for both men and for women. And we have roughly 100,000 people who use these services over the course of a year. And we have over 100 national Darfurian staff that run this program. It's really, it's really quite something to see it in action. But when you are in these camps, it is so hard to hear these stories and to feel as if anything that you're doing is making any kind of impact at all. And I remember sitting with women in the camps, all, they had lost all of their male family members and they would explain to me that in the evenings they would get together and they would try to figure out who was going to go to collect food and firewood the next day because rape was a certainty. And inevitably it would be the grandmothers who would offer to go. I mean, imagine making such excruciating choices every day for years. So what might you do and how might you actually make a contribution on an international stage. I have four very quick suggestions I want to leave you with this evening, and then we're going to open it up for some questions. You know, in my experience, and this is the first one, true social change anywhere in the world, it begins with knowledge, and it begins with information. It really is about education, but our education as well. You know, don't let tonight be the only time that you think about current affairs, international affairs. Take the time to read or watch at least one piece of international news each week because it will help you connect with some of these issues and understand them. You know, it's very easy to watch a conflict that's unfolding in the world and be taken by surprise and to not really understand all the subtleties of the arguments and the personalities and how it all came to be. But over time, if you make that investment in furthering your own knowledge and understanding, it is remarkable, it is remarkable how much easier it is to really recognize some of the root causes of violence and what it is that you might begin to do about them. And if you would like some help with this, um, I, I also, I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm Samantha Nutt. I usually post a couple of times a week articles that I find to be interesting and compelling and, and worth sharing if that makes your life easier. And if this will be my only shameless book plug of the evening, um, many of the conflicts I've spoken about here this evening and the issues and a huge number of, of resources, electronic resources, are listed at the end of, uh, of my book and I get into all of this in much more detail. So number one is true social change really does begin with knowledge and it begins with information. Number two, if you care about these issues, 
it is critically important to give. Organizations that are working internationally can only continue with these types of initiatives and make them sustainable if they can rely on their donor base. And to that end, you know, it's important to know how to give. We often see a crisis in the news. We see Haiti, we see the tsunami, we're like a bunch of ambulance chasers. It's at those moments that we write a check, and then we're frustrated a couple of years later when nothing seems to change. In my experience, and I've seen the impact of good development and bad development all around the world, it is much better to have a relationship with an organization to give a smaller amount of money on a monthly basis to make that consistent investment which allows organizations to properly plan and continue with their programs over a longer period of time. So a smaller amount of money given regularly is infinitely better than a large amount of money when the mood strikes, which tends to be much more ineffective. And yet we don't often, uh, I, I think that we don't often really appreciate the importance of that. And if you do want more information about what Warchild is doing around the world, our website is warchild.us. But change on a local level only happens when those consistent investments are being made. And I will often say to audiences, it takes a generation to see, to really see the effects of well-managed aid. And it takes no less than a generation of ongoing partnership and local capacity building to actually arrive there. So number one is knowledge and information. Number two is giving. Number three, we really can make a difference just by changing the way that we shop and the way that we invest. On a very sort of easy level, demand a certificate of origin if you are buying a precious stone of any kind. Before you buy your next cell phone, computer, or video game console, or even as a gift, take the time to write or email the manufacturer to ask how you can be sure that the resources used in that manufacturing process were ethically mined. And there's a really great website, again, this is in the book, but if there's a fantastic initiative out of Washington called the Enough Project, which is Pentergast initiative, and the website is the enoughproject.org, they actually have the icons of every single electronics company from IBM to Apple. They really do, and they're all rated in terms of the, the amount of transparency that they provide around, uh, around mining in, in, in uh, conflict and post-conflict countries around the world. It's extremely helpful. And here uh, in the U.S., the Dodd-Frank legislation, for those of you who have heard about this, and again, I get into this in more detail in the book, but it's also on the Enough Project website. The Dodd-Frank legislation has been, I think, really, truly groundbreaking in terms of creating, at the moment, unfortunately, it's a voluntary transparency initiative, so companies have to voluntarily report where they're sourcing their, uh, uh, their hard goods from, um, their hard components from. But I still find that to be at least a step in the right direction, and it's really important. It's been heavily criticized because the response has been to immediately shut down the mines and, and put exacerbate levels of poverty because to, to put um, artisanal miners out of work. And that's really unfortunate because while it is true that we have to approach these issues from different points of view, from a political point of view, from a policy point of view, from an aid point of view, from a corporate social responsibility point of view, you, you really do have to start. And, and work it out work it as you, as you move forward. And I think it's been a great, great piece of legislation. So let your policymakers know about that. So number one is knowledge and information. Number two is giving. Number three is socially responsible consumer and investment practices. And then finally, and this one's actually, I think, the easiest one of all, to really make a difference in the lives of those who are living with war and poverty globally. It begins when we stop seeding as a society to this idea that life and loss are inherently more relevant over here than over there. Five million dead in the Congo, 300,000 dead in Darfur, more than 70,000 people who died as a result of the conflict in Sri Lanka, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilian deaths in the war in Iraq, 
30,000 kids abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army, initially out of northern Uganda, but now also in eastern Congo. More than 30 million people living with HIV AIDS worldwide. Half, half of all maternal and child deaths that take place in the world today take place on the continent of Africa. And so we all need to work hard to build those bridges and to connect ourselves to these social justice challenges we face globally and encourage this kind of socially responsible thinking and action. You know, we may not, in the end, have all the answers, but sometimes I have found over the course of doing this work that it is enough, it is enough to simply start by at least asking the questions. You know, when I first landed in Somalia, I saw myself as a doctor, and in no way did I see myself as an activist. But back then, I didn't know what it means to live with war. But I can tell you that I do know what it means now. And I know what it means to lie in bed in the darkest of nights and to listen to that crackle of automatic gunfire and to wonder how many more minutes I have left until it will be right on top of me. And I can tell you it is the most horrifying feeling that you can ever endure. And over the years of doing this work, war has killed far too many people close to me. And on a couple of occasions, it has almost killed me. But I get up and I do what I do every single day because I really genuinely believe, despite the criticisms, despite the cynicism, that we can affect social change and build better communities locally as well as globally. And let me just conclude by saying that to that end, you know, what I have found more than anything else over the years is that, and this is true no matter whether you're talking about here at home or whether you're talking about uh, a war-torn country. You know, those who play on fear and those who practice the politics of division and those who fuel nationalistic fervor and hate, they are strengthened by ignorance and by public resignation. Their power literally depends on the powerlessness of others, and it is ours to reject. And to that end, I want to wish you all the greatest success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Your, um, your lecture was mm -hmm. extraordinarily inspiring and informative and convicts us to think more deeply about ourselves in relation to the world and all the tragedy and, and crises that exist. So thank you so much for bringing our awareness to these issues. And thank you for your, your example, not just what you talk about, but what you are. We do have some time for some questions, and uh, if you have a question, please come to the microphone because this is being videoed for UC Television. So if you would please come forward if you have questions, and I'll recognize you, and she will respond. And that's the knuckle answer. And, and yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Roof and uh, Dr. Nutt. Um, Walter Capps, when he was alive, uh, spent much of his time at the university chronicling the effect both of victims of war and also the psychological effect on warriors. And of course, he gave the last part of his life trying to change that in Congress. Mm -hmm. In your experience, are there any people in elected or American public life that you think are really doing progressive things that Walter, if he was alive, would 
be getting behind so that we can watch for them and try to support them. Thank you. That's an excellent question, and I had the good fortune of, uh, of learning about Walter and his life uh, over dinner, and um, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's phenomenally inspiring, and I think it's a wonderful legacy for for all of you here, um, and, and I think it's one you can be very, all be very very proud of. I, you know. It, I, the, the trauma of war is is deep for civilians and and for those who um, who fight in our armed forces and with something we've experienced in Canada as well a uh, severe amount of post traumatic stress disorder um, when you look at Gulf War syndrome and the amount of denial that went into to that when soldiers returned home and I was in Iraq uh, in the early 90s I've been to Iraq many many times and and it was very obvious that depleted uranium was having an impact on people's on people's lives and their well their health their health and well being and and yet the supports that exist are really few and far between. And I wish that I could tell you that I knew of somebody who was uh, at the political level who was doing groundbreaking work in this, in this instance. Unfortunately, the last few years, our discourse in Canada and the United States has really been an economic one, and it's been dominated by the, the economic recession. And so to, I think there are tremendous risks involved politically for people to begin to uh, advocate for increased social spending on, on any level, um, and the risks that go along with that when you're talking about a particularly a psychological need, because there's, it's, um, it, you just don't know what the timeline is going to be, you don't know what the expense is going to be, you don't know whether that person is actually permanently disabled or not, and so there's a huge amount of deniability that goes into that. Um, there are some good groups that do uh, work around, uh, but, they're, but they're all outside of the political process that do psychological work with um, um, w with victims, and uh, I'm not sure of any that are, exist here locally, but I know that the Center for Victims of Torture is, for example, one that has a, a number of different uh, international um, connections, and, uh, and it's something that's that's, uh, I think they're doing very good, very, very good work. But it's, you know, it's a, a huge disappointment, huge disappointment. And uh, I, wish, I wish that that were not the case. Most simple question, the Dodd what legislation? Oh, Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank, Frank. yes. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned at the beginning um, the uh, acceleration of climate change as being a major uh, problem in Africa. I wonder if you could speak more to that and also um, your suggestions as how civil society might get involved uh, in the global problem. Well, that's that's a really tough one. Um, you know, uh, climate change. There are climate change deniers everywhere. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's. Uh, you know, we are seeing the impact of climate change in an African context, and we are seeing the risk that this presents to conflict-affected societies. Um, the, uh, you know, when I was in Darfur, there's some interesting evidence. Uh, there's a great guy that uh, I know, but he's also done some really critical work in this area called Alex DeWall, um, looking, making the case for why Darfur is actually the world's first environmental war, that it's being driven but that because of, of climate change and accelerated drought, um, that it was actually forcing the nomads to come into conflict with, uh, with the sort of local population. And um, it was a lot of it was over agricultural, degrading agricultural land and, and water resources and I think that when we are beginning to see more of that now it's hard it's all it's always hard to prove cause and effect right I mean when you look at what happened in in Somalia in the horn um, over the summer months was that just the usual cycle of, of drought that kind of tipped the balance there in terms of um, civilian lives, or, or is that actually directly linked to climate change? There are some groups that are doing some, I think, interesting work around this. Partners in Health has been doing some work uh, on this, and they're a fantastic American organization founded by Paul Farmer, if you're, if you're interested in that, in that link. And there are some there are a number of different kind of academic studies that are looking at issues of water um, and, uh, and land use and, and how it is that you bridge that to to promote better development and to reduce conflict around the world. But I mean, how do you, you know, we face this, I face this in Canada, as, we face this in Canada as well. I, I sit on the board of a, of a major um, uh, environmental foundation called the David Suzuki Foundation in Canada, and they're doing great work. Um, but, you know, uh, the, oh, 
Big Oil is uh, actively funding the counter-narrative. The mining companies are actively funding the counter-narrative. Um, we tried to have our own version of the Dodd-Frank legislation, for example, come through Parliament uh, twice, and uh, once it didn't get to a vote, and the first time the mining sector, the 75 percent of the world's mining companies are actually headquartered in Canada, and uh, we are implicated in four times as many transgressions as the next two biggest offenders, which are India and Australia. So. That's something to be proud of. Um, and you know they actively lobbied against it, and it, it didn't pass. So the same types of things, we, we all deal with these same types of things in terms of, of lobbying and the impact of big business on our parliamentary processes and our political processes. Um, and and those who are who are aggressive about the, the counter narrative, which is which is deeply flawed. And how do you how do you get around that? You get around that by continuing to speak up and speak out and to write and to lobby and to advocate and hope that traditional forms of protest will be able to make a difference. I'm not quite clear on how the weapons, how three-fourths of the weapons get to the civilians. I can understand why rich companies that produce the weapons in rich countries uh, would give them to a dictator so that the dictator would enforce, you know, an environment that's good for the company to, you know, rape the natural resources. And I can understand why the company would sell them to the companies that are working in there because they have the money to buy them. But three-fourths of them get out to civilians? Is there some incentive to create chaos out in the... Well, they're in the hands of civilians. So what happens is, you know, many of the weapons you see in circulation, for example, were manufactured in the 1950s. And so the one thing that we do know about automatic weapons, especially the Kalashnikov rifle, which is one of the world's most efficient automatic weapons, is that they're virtually indestructible. And so in a practical sense, what that means is that its first stop will never be its last stop. So when you think about, um, you know, I'll give you a really good example. The, the, the mismanagement of the aftermath of the Iraq war was so spectacular that hundreds of thousands of weapons uh, were ended up in circulation in Iraq, that some of which were former Saddam weapons, like Republican Guard weapons, some of them were being brought in from Lebanon. They were being brought in from Jordan. They were being brought in from Syria. We saw the same thing in Libya, uh, where they found you know, all kinds of weapons, and there was very little tracing that went on. The thing to understand about a weapon and the impact it has in a developing country is that it's it's almost like your ticket to entrepreneurialism. And, and you know, I'll give you one really good example. I was When I, when I was in Somalia, I went up to uh, this this clinic in the north, and I went trudging along, and uh, there was this, an area that had very, very high rates of cholera, and so I went to look, one of, an NGO had built, a non-governmental organization had built a, a latrine, and I was curious as to why nobody was actually using this latrine. And so I go over there, and there's a guy standing there holding an AK-47, and so I said, well, what are you doing? I'm protecting the latrine, he says to me. I said, well, what do you mean you're protecting the latrine? Well, I'm charging everybody 75 cents to use it. And that, for him, was a way to make money. So he had a gun, and, and you see this. I mean, I've seen this in Afghanistan. You see it all around the world. People want the weapons to protect themselves. People want the weapons because it's status. It, it shows that you have arrived. People want weapons because that's how you do business. That's how you're able to you know, generate. You rent it out. You get hired off as security guards. Um, and, you know, and kids, right? I mean, kids in, as, as, as child soldiers. These are not organized, legitimate, recognized armies. These are, I itinerant groups of, of gangs um, that are being forced or coerced into doing things that they should not be doing. And so when we talk about 75% of them being in the hands of civilians, that's where a lot of it comes from, unfortunately. In Afghanistan, it's same in, same in uh, northern Ethiopia, where I was uh, recently, um, it's, a, it's status. You don't, have a, you don't have a gun. You, there's something wrong with you, you know, because otherwise you're just a, a sitting duck is the perception. Is there any talk about um, arming women with guns? <laughs> I, I, I was a soldier in Israel. You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess my answer to that would be that I, I, you know, I think the problem is that there are too many guns as opposed to putting more guns into the, into the hands of people. Um, you know, it, it's, 
the, really what we need is disarmament. And I don't think that you tackle the issue of disarmament by flooding the markets with, uh, uh, with arms, um, whether they're for men or for women or for children or for you know, peacekeepers, whatever it happens to be. And so that's what I would like to see more of. And if you're talking about um, rape as well, it's not just a question of, of arms. It's also a question of impunity. You look at places like the Eastern Congo where their entire judicial infrastructure crumbled. Not that there was one to begin with. I mean, it was, it was mostly, uh, you know, uh, it was so easy to subvert that judicial system in the first place. Um, but you can't even, people act with impunity because there, there is no punishment that fits the crime. At your sites in these countries, um, sounds like you're dealing with tr rape, rape trauma and education and so on. Do you have sort of a, an approach or is sort of what I guess I'm asking, what are the services that go on in these in these sites? It varies uh, from country to country. You know, one of the things that we're doing, and I get into this in a lot more detail uh, in the book, has to do with access to justice. So it's actually training of lawyers and paralegals and judges in, um, in different countries and actually bringing uh, prosecutions forward. So we have a program that we pioneered in northern Uganda, which we're actually now replicating in eastern Congo. And uh, it's, it's been very, very successful. So we have a, a number of different things. We do community-based outreach. We do um, training programs. We work with teachers as well in schools to identify and work with young girls who have been victims of sexual abuse. Uh, we also run radio sensitization programs, and those are all done by women, and they reach out into the communities, and then women are able to, to come forward and receive support. So you need both things happening. You need the kind of community-based intervention. You also need to work with the men to, to help them understand why rape is a crime and, uh, and, and the problems associated with that, and then at the same at the same time, you also have to work to actually build some kind of a, of a legal infrastructure. Because at the end of the day, you know, some of these children themselves are, are deeply traumatized. They can also be supported and helped. But I've also worked with some of these young boys, and some of these young boys are, have become, for better or for worse, literally psychopaths. And uh, some of them you just you know that as much as you try to invest in them, eventually they're going to end up in jail. Uh, the problem is that there's, there's no kind of process that exists locally, and, um, and women are paying the price. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Great. Yes. How do the women cope that, with the pregnancies that result um, from the rapes, and do they have any access at all to clinics for family planning? care at all in these countries? It, again, it varies. Um, some of them don't seek the services, which is part of the reason why the radio programming becomes extremely important, is to let them know that these services are available. But because of the stigma attached to rape, many of them don't. There are some good clinics, though, uh, particularly in the Eastern Congo. There's one out of um, uh, Panzer Hospital, and uh, it's in Bukavu. And they do a lot of work with rape victims, and they do fistula repairs, and, and, uh, and, and you know they treat many, many rape victims over the course of, of a year. Um, but a lot of it has to do with access as well. And if you're living in a very rural area and the roads are really insecure, even if you wanted help, from whom would you seek it? And, and this is really a, a, a huge, huge issue. You know, I'd like to suggest to you that, um, that we have the tools at our disposal to, to fix it, but we don't. What we have are the tools at our disposal to make women's lives incrementally better. And over time, um, we have to hope that that will tilt the balance. I wanted to ask uh, how you became interested in um, public health and then what led you to become interested in international aid and development. Great, that's a, that's a very nice question, thank you. I was terrible at surgery. So that, that narrowed the field. Um, the, uh, you know, for me, I've, I've always been interested in that bridge between the social and the political and the economic, I guess what we usually call the determinants of health and, um, and people's lives. And so I was actually an arts student before I went to medical school. I know that sounds really strange, but just accept that for what it is. And, um, I, I did. I actually, after high school, studied uh, drama and 19th century romantic English literature on scholarship in the UK, and then spent the entire year being cast as a 13-year-old prepubescent boy. And 
<laughs> I'm quite serious. Um, uh, there are only, yeah, so many times that you can play Ernie in, yeah, anyway. Um, so, I, uh, so then I ended up, so, but I was always very interested in um, that sort of social political analysis and how it shapes uh, health outcomes. And that was really, that really is the essence of public health. And that was why I found it so exciting. And, and I still do find it very exciting. And the nice thing about public health is that there are different aspects to it. You know, you can do the, the hardcore kind of disease um, contagion type uh, activities, or you can do more of the international health that, that I do. Uh, I became interested in international health. I spent quite a bit of time overseas when I was growing up. And so I always felt that I wanted to have a, a, some sort of a contribution or make a contribution on an international level. Um, and then in medical school became more exposed and more interested to it. But my first real opportunity was with Somalia. And I, I, but I do want to preface it by saying that I'm not an advocate for those kind of short-term, two-week overseas stints. And I get into this more in the book because I really do think you have to be trained and qualified for the task. And that's why I approached it at a later stage of my professional career. And still, it's a learning trajectory. And, um, but I find it to be one that is extremely challenging and extremely frustrating and extremely rewarding, sometimes within the same hour. And uh, no, quite literally. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, I, I don't know. It, you know, for me, I feel very, very grateful that I do what I do because it, um, it's, it's very, very inspiring at the end of the day. Uh, good evening. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you, Dr. Annette, for, for your inspiring talk and also very sobering talk. Um, I myself have had some experience in the international world um, in Uganda and Kenya and Africa as well. Um, and one of the things I've taken back is the beautiful sense of community and culture that they carry. And that's something that I feel like the United States lacks. And I'm asking the question of as the f what might come in the future here environmentally and with the economy and everything, the aid work that might be needed in the United States and what you might um, offer it as, a, as advice to us in the first world, in the overdeveloped world. That's an interesting, that's a very interesting question. Um, it's, it's, that's always the tension though, right? Is how much do you focus here and how much do you focus uh, globally? Obviously we have tremendous needs here at home as well. Um, and whether you're talking about in Canada, especially you know the the Aboriginal uh, crisis, and it really is a crisis in, in our country, uh, homelessness, uh, child poverty. Um, it's we are. I think we are. We have. I wouldn't say we are entering into. I think we have drifted into um, a very self-interested moment in human history, and. Um, and until we begin to change that narrative, that narrative around why tax cuts are good and social spending is bad, um, which is something I never, I, I, I mean, sometimes I find I don't even have myself the tools that I need because intellectually I just can't wrap my head around that. Um, you know, until we begin to change that narrative and begin to value um, social development locally as well. I, I just don't know how you even begin to make those changes. But what I, what I will say is that from anywhere in the world, um, from adversity comes opportunity. And from adversity often comes community. And it's a tremendous, sometimes it comes at a tremendous, tremendous price. But I think that there, we, I hope that we're entering into a period of, of rejuvenation. Um, when we wake up and, and realize that, that our financial institutions have let us down, that the, the dream of being richer than previous generations has failed. Um, while that can be daunting uh, to many of us, I think it also creates room for us to begin to redefine success in human terms instead of in material and in economic terms. And that's one of the lessons that I have learned, as, as you have, from my work all around the world. Um, people who have nothing are so rich in so many other ways that we often can't even 
begin to to appreciate, let alone to 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 replicate. Um, but I do think that that the next few years, if we're consistent, um, we do have some opportunities to to begin to redefine what success actually means and to build those communities and to change that narrative. And I certainly hope. And I hear from young people around the world all the time, but especially young Americans and young Canadians, people who are under the age of 35. And while there's tremendous cynicism about youth, the one thing that I do find that's extremely exciting is that they have grown up in much more global terms. And they uh, have also grown up with, without feeling like they are going to do better than their parents ever did. And from that has come a tremendous strength. And like it or not, you know, in terms of appreciate it or not, I mean, one of the ways that we saw that manifest itself was in the, the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, which I thought was very bold and very brave and very courageous. And, and even if it may not have accomplished what it set out to accomplish, the statement that it made was that it was putting our policymakers on notice, and that it was working towards a different vision of what uh, America should be, and at home, what Canada should be as well, home for me. And, um, and I really hope that when they begin running for office, that they're going to come at it differently. We might have to wait 10 years, but we'll see. <laughs>